that's on, what was it, Rick? What was the, just higher? Okay. The sound, now that we have the sound going downstairs, we can start. Um, we want to welcome you here in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it is good to be here. I want to invite you to quiet your heart. We're going to read again from Psalm 34, a psalm that has been read quite a bit lately because of our texts in 1 Peter. Um, a psalm written by David as he was in danger himself. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord, so let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me, let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me, he delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor person he called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life, desires to see many good days, then keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil, do good, seek peace, pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones and not one of them will be broken. The evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Lord God, we come here very simply because of you. That somehow, some way we know, and maybe in many ways we know, of your goodness and your mercy in our lives, your saving hand that we have tasted tasted you. We have seen that you are good. So as we come together to worship you, may we bless your name. May we praise you, the King of Heaven. May praise rise up as we declare how great you are. And may we be forever grateful. 
because you are the king of kings. Jesus, we love you. Father, thank you for being our Father. Spirit of God, come and have your way here today. Speak to us, even as we invite you, and even as we choose to open ourselves up to what you want to say to us today, to do in us, to speak, to act. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, right. Okay, sorry, Chris. Just um, it was updating, and then it didn't let me update. Again, technology. Let's stand together as we can and sing. All praise to you who reigns above in majesty supreme. You gave your son for men to die that you might men redeem. Blessed be your name, blessed be your name, blessed be your name, O Lord. Blessed be your name, blessed be your name, blessed be your name, O Lord. Your name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. At God the Father's own right hand, where angel hosts adore. Blessed be your name, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, O Lord. Blessed be your name, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, O Lord. Redeemer, Savior, friend of man, once ruined by the fall, you have devised salvation's plan, for you have died for all. Blessed be your name, blessed be your name, blessed be your name, O Lord. Blessed be your name, blessed be your name, blessed be your name, O Lord. Your name shall be the Counselor, the mighty Prince of Peace, of all earth's kingdoms conqueror. Your reign will never cease. Blessed be your name, blessed be your name, blessed be your name, O Lord. Blessed be your name, blessed be your name, blessed be your name, O
fathers in distress. Praise you still the same as ever, slow to chide and quick to bless. Alleluia, alleluia, praise the everlasting King. Father, like Yes, there we go. Yes, yes. Angels in the height adore you. You behold him face to face. Sun and moon bow down before you. Dwellers all in time and space. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the everlasting. Oh, 
all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. You wrap yourself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at your voice, and trembles at your voice. How great
Thank you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Um, Chris. Um. Well, micro. Is there a microphone available? First Peter 1. <clears throat> I, Peter, am an apostle on assignment by Jesus, the Messiah, writing to exiles scattered to the four winds. Not one is missing, not one forgotten. God the Father has his eye on each of you and has determined by the work of the Spirit to keep you obedient through the sacrifice of Jesus. May everything good from God be yours. What a God we have, and how fortunate we are to have him, this father of our master Jesus. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we have been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future starts now. God is keeping careful watch over us and the future. The day is coming when you'll have it all, life healed and whole. I know how great this makes you feel, even though you have to put up with every kind of aggravation in the meantime. Pure gold put in the fire comes out of it proved pure. Genuine faith put through th this suffering comes out proved genuine. When Jesus wraps this all up, it's your faith, not your gold, that God will have on display as evidence of his victory. You never saw him, yet you love him. You still don't see him, yet you trust him with laughter and singing. Because you kept on believing, you will get what you're looking forward to, total salvation. The prophets who told us this was coming asked a lot of questions about this gift of life that God was preparing. The Messiah's spirit let them in on some of it, that the Messiah would experience suffering followed by glory. They clamored to know who and when and all they were told was that they were serving you. You who by orders from heaven have now heard for yourselves through the Holy Spirit, the message of those prophecies fulfilled. Do you realize how fortunate you are? Angels would have given anything to be in on this. So, roll up your sleeves, get your head in the game, be totally ready to receive the gift that's coming when Jesus arrives. Don't lazily slip back into those old grooves of evil doing just what you feel like doing. You didn't know any better then, but you do now. As obedient children, let yourselves be pulled into a way of life shaped by God's life, a life energetic and blazing with holiness God said, I am holy, you be holy. You call out to God for help, and he helps. He's a good father that way. But don't forget, he is also a responsible father and won't let you get by with sloppy living. Your life is a journey that you must travel with deep consciousness of God. It cost God plenty to get you out of that dead end, empty headed life that you grew up in. He paid with Christ's sacred blood, you know. He died 
like an unblemished sacrificial lamb. And this was no afterthought. Sorry. And this was no afterthought. Even though it has only lately, at the end of the ages, become public knowledge, God always knew he was going to do this for you. It is because of this sacrificed Messiah, whom God then raised from the dead and glorified, that you can now trust God, that you know you have a future in God. Now that you've cleaned up your lives by following the truth, love one another as if your lives depended on it. Your new life is not like your old life. Your old birth came from mortal sperm. Your new birth comes from God's living word. Just think, a life conceived by God himself. That's why the prophet said, the old life is a grassy life. It's beauty as short-lived as wild flowers. Grass dries up. Flowers wilt. God's word goes on and on forever. This is the word that conceived the new life in you. So, clean house. Make a clean sweep of malice and pretense, envy and hurtful talk. You've had a taste of God. Now, like infants at the breast, Drink deep of God's pure kindness. Then you will grow up mature and whole in God. Welcome to the living stone, the source of life. The workman took one look and threw it out. God set it in the place of honor. Present yourselves as building stones for the construction of a sanctuary vibrant with life, in which you will serve as holy priests, offering Christ-approved lives up to God. The scriptures provi provide precedent. Look, I'm setting a stone in Zion, a cornerstone in the place of honor. Whoever trusts in this stone as a foundation will never have cause to regret it. To you who trust him, he is a stone to be proud of. But to those who refuse to trust him, the stone the workman threw out, or the stone the workman threw out is now the chief foundation stone. For the untrusting, it's a stone to trip over and a boulder blocking the way. They trip and fall because they refuse to obey, just as predicted. But you are the ones chosen by God chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do, to do his work and speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference that he made for you, from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. And I'm forever grateful to you. And I'm forever grateful for the cross. And I'm forever grateful to you that you came to seek and save the lost. Well, good morning. If you are a Christian, that is, if you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you are no longer dead or lost or doomed or without hope or alone or an orphan or without a family. You are now part of y'all. I refer to this every so often because the frustrating challenge of of Greek or of English languages, there is no y'all in English. The Southerners have it right, and I'm thankful that they created it. Um, you, 
that's you, all. Because a lot of the New Testament, a lot of scripture is written in the plural. You, when it says you, we, we personalize it and we think it's me, when in fact it's meaning y'all. And one of the great challenges is we, um, especially in our individualistic society, where we think all about me, we lose out on the all, the corporate nature of God's word that he writes to us as a people. And today, we are getting a whole lot of y'all, okay? So if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you are part of y'all. So what are y'all? Or who are y'all? Peter is going to tell us using four simple descriptions from the Old Testament that we're going to look into. Again, knowing that Peter is steeped both in the, in the Old Testament and in the life and teaching of Christ. And the very first one is, we're just going to go through this fast because it's hot and it's going to get hotter and um, I don't want people to snore while I'm preaching. Uh, if, if you believe, no, sorry, uh, the first one is, Peter says, is, but y'all are a chosen people. Peter takes this phrase from Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43 is written to the exiled nation of Israel in Babylon. Okay? Which is interesting, by the way, because in case you don't remember, Peter begins his letter by talking about that they're in exile. And then he finishes the letter by saying he's writing from Babylon, which is Rome. In other words, Paul, Peter is, again, integrating the story of Israel into the teaching that he is, and the letter that he is writing to these people, which speaks of the continuity of God's work in the world, which is why in verses 110 to, I think it's 110 to 12, where he speaks about the prophets. So he refers to the prophets, how they, they spoke the word of God. They knew something was happening. God was up to something, and they yearned to see. And now Peter is going to explain what they yearned to see, or is explaining, I should say. So Isaiah 43 reads like this. Let's get rid of that. Now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob... He who formed you, O Israel. Remember, we talked last week a bit about choosing, right? That we have choices to make. God makes choices as well. And he chose Jacob. He chose Israel. He created them. He formed them. And he redeemed them. So he says, fear not. Remember, they're running. Isaiah is speaking to the people in exile. Okay, they're, they're away from their home. Just like the people, the readers of Peter, 1 Peter are. They're away from their home. Both are oppressed people in many ways. And the Lord says to them, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. So when you pass through the waters, which means difficulty, challenges, I will be with you and through the rivers and they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, because you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. These are words that, and ideas that Peter is creating and borrowing and wanting us to draw, think back to and, and his readers to hear. He then continues in 19 to 21. He says, see, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Don't you see it? Don't you perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness, streams in the wasteland. 
The wild animals honor me. The jackals and the owls honor me. Why? Because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. God is the bringer and the giver of life where there is no life. To give drink to my people, my chosen people, the people I form for myself so that they may proclaim my praise. My people, a chosen people. In the time of Isaiah, when those texts were written, the chosen people were the descendants of Abraham. And why were they chosen? Because so that God might have a people for himself who would proclaim his praise, to proclaim his mighty acts. And so the whole Jewish calendar is all about how God has saved, has redeemed, has saved, has saved. It's a story of God's activity, saving hand in the lives of his people, his mercy, his faithfulness, his love. And so when it comes to the new covenant, Peter is saying, hey, those who believe in Jesus Christ are a chosen people. They are God's chosen people. And his purposes still remain the same that we may Declare the praises of him who called y'all. But the praises weren't just what we did this morning, where we sing. The praises fundamentally are praises with a life that brings praise to God. It's consistent throughout the Bible that praises were first and foremost to be a life that bears and reflects the name of God. Lives that are holy. And Peter's no different. In, in fact, already in 115 and 16, as we've just heard, he said, but just as you, who he, he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Joby writes, Peter here makes the radical claim that those who believe in Jesus Christ, whether they are Jew or Gentile or Greek or Roman or Cappadocian or Bithynian or, or whatever, though many nationalities and ethnicities, that they are a new people, a new people who have been born again into the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he's trying to hammer on home. He is hammering home these people who are feeling like they are in exile. They are in exile. Who are feeling increasingly pressure socially. Who are feeling ridiculed and mocked and dishonored. And he is trying and he's going to, his goal here is to simply say, hey, do you realize who you are? Other people don't have a clue. They think you're nothing. But you are a chosen people. But it's not just the chosen people that y'all who believe in Jesus are. You are also, y'all are a royal priesthood. So what does a priest do? A priest is someone who, simply put, mediates between God and the rest of you. Right? That's what a priest does on behalf of the people. And did you know that every believer is a priest? Peter is the only one to give this title to y'all, by the way. This, however, does not mean we are all in the formal role of a priest as we would understand it, say, like as a Catholic or an Anglican or an Orthodox priest or even maybe as a pastor. What it does mean is something really much more rich. Scott McKnight writes, for a Jewish reader, there's two things going on here. There's royalty, right? There's a royal, which means how the, 
it's an interesting term because royalty and priesthood don't necessarily, don't traditionally go together. But royalty was beyond one's natural abilities because royalty was inherited at the time for the Jewish person. And I suspect most Jews would have thought of the line of King David, right? That's royalty. Unless one was part of David's genealogy, being a part of royalty was unthinkable. When Queen Elizabeth died, they didn't say, oh, let's go find someone in the land. Let's see who can do that, become the next king or queen. No, it was his, her son that became the king, oldest son. So for us to be called, for, for Peter to say you are royal was a newfound privilege of being that was unbelievable. It was, wow, I'm part of royalty. I am a son, a daughter, a child of the king. And not just any king, but the king of kings, the creator of heaven and earth. David, sorry, David, Peter wants them to hear that. Do you realize your royalty? Yes, you may be ridiculed by the people around you. You may be persecuted by the people. You may be feeling all kinds of pressure by the people who are around you who look at you weirdly. But in God's eyes, you are royalty. And then the second one was the priesthood. To the notion of royalty, the idea of priesthood. And here the Jewish connection is really important. The priests were from special families among the nation of Israel. They served God by mediating between the people and God, as I said. To be a priest was a privilege beyond comparison because it involved entry into the very special courts and the holy places of the temple in order to make human concerns before God and to apply God's forgiveness. So, to call all members, y'all, y'all, are a royal priesthood, meant, number one, that we were the children of God, named by him, called by him to be a role in this world. To be given one of the, the highest statuses, both in terms of royalty, in terms of political, but also in terms of the spiritual, that we have been given the highest status. So as we go on, we, we realize, Lord God, in whatever we're going through, we have a privilege to be God, your presence in this world, to be your priest in this world, to represent you as the, the king is called us to. Peter has already, after stating that we are like living stones that we are building, be built into a spiritual household to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That the living stones that through the ages and across the world are together, y'all, being built into a spiritual household. And again, this is why it's so important. We, I thought last week I talked a bit about time, how we need, we as Christians, have the wonderful benefit of time because in this world today that is the humanistic world that doesn't believe in anything before or after that we just go back to the earth whatever it might be all the different renditions we just have this time while we're on this earth I was speaking to someone last week and that was his statement his very statement was I just think I just go back to the earth but we don't we don't believe that our time we have a past that is beyond before we even began. And we have a future that is eternal. And so we have all of eternity as believers. So 
So Peter writes, Joby, the, the theme of obedience and holiness, the entire nation of ancient Israel was to be set aside, set apart from the nations of the world to serve God through obedience and through the covenant with him. And he says now that Christian believers are to do that same thing, that we have a responsibility, a purpose in this world to be God's presence, to be his priests. As Peter, Paul wrote in Romans 12, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Thirdly, y'all, y'all are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. First century Rome was not their nation. It was not their culture. They were a new nation. It was a, they were a new holy nation. Exodus 24 talks about that. And this is our calling, y'all, are a holy nation, chosen by God, set apart, our words of honor and prestige. It's like King Charles, if he were to call you up and say, hey Esther, I need someone to represent me in the boundary country. Would you be willing to do that? And Esther says, no, no, I don't want to. It's okay. I'm too busy. No, it wouldn't happen. Joby writes, first century Christians were often persecuted and executed, not because they worshipped Jesus, because you know what? They lived in a polyistic theistic Creek society. You realize that? Like they, there was lots of gods. There was, what's one more god? No, the reason was because of the higher claim of the gospel that only in Christ is the one true God to be worshipped. Very much the same today. Because the prosperity and welfare of the empire was believed to be, depend on religious forces, right? You... you the emperor, that you, you, you wanted to appease the gods, to serve the gods so that you, the empire, did well. The Christian's exclusive allegiance to Jesus as God was viewed negatively to the rest of society. From that perspective, citizens were actually bad citizens of the empire. This made them the object of accusations of treason and increasingly that became the case whereby they had to be dealt with we are a holy nation together y'all the final description is a people belonging to God as we heard two weeks ago this is God's heart Peter is alluding to Exodus 19.5 where Yahweh speaking to Israel says, Now if you obey me and fully keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. He's also referring here to Isaiah 43 which we just read where he calls Israel my people, my chosen people, the people I formed for myself. A few weeks ago I... Two weeks ago, I read that the, this, the picture of, or I told you the story, I led you into an imaginary world where you're walking with, and God is walking with you. And I had God respond to your question of why, why was God suddenly in this walk kind of sad? And he says, because I wish you would ask me a question, because this guy was going to ask him all kinds of questions. But this is the question that God wishes we would ask him. What is it that I yearn for more than anything else? And his answer is, biblically speaking, God's answer is, I want a people whose hearts are for me. I want a people for myself. Plain and simple. This is the cry of God. 
This is the yearning of God. This is what God's been working through towards all through history, starting when Adam and Eve, who were his people, and then turned their backs and said, no, we don't want to be your God. Or we don't want, we, we don't want to be your people. We want to be someone else's people. We're going to do our own thing. And all of this is that we may declare the praises of him who called y'all out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now y'all are a people of God. Once y'all had not received mercy, but now y'all have received mercy. Darkness without hope, lost. Now in God's presence there is the warmth of light and life. Now a people, not a, but now a people. Not a people, but now a people. The people of God without mercy in this merciless world. But now y'all have received mercy. This picture here again is from Hosea 2. In Hosea 2, again, it's written to people in exile. And they were a people who had turned their backs on God. And so out of darkness, they were in darkness because they were in exile. They were not God's people because they had turned away from Him. And they had not received mercy because God let them, in fulfilling the covenant agreement, he, which said that if you turn your back on me, you will be going into exile. And so they simply fulfilled what God had said and their, what their covenant they entered into was. But in Hosea, he says, listen, I will show you mercy. I will bring you back as my people. I will call you into light. In conclusion, Peter, in the letter so far, has been working hard at making sure that his readers understand the solid foundation that they have in God through Jesus Christ. That we are the fulfillment of God's greatest yearning. That we are God's chosen people. That we are his royal priesthood. That we are a holy nation. That we are a people who belong to God. That we were dead. That we were in darkness. That we were lost. That we were without mercy. And we now live in God's light. We now belong to a community of God's people. We now live because of God's mercy. Now, there's one other piece here that I want to just bring it, bring tie to the end, and that is a y'all part. You see, because again, we so individualize our faith, We fail to understand that <laughs> these are all about the communities. It's all of us together. It's being committed to one another. As the author of Hebrews says, listen, don't neglect getting together. Come and figure out what it means to be the people of God together, what it means to work together, what is it that God is calling the people in the boundary who follow him what is he calling us to do and be? And that's the invitation that we're going to be looking at more and more as we go through the letter of Peter. What does it mean to be the people of God? I'm going to invite Chris to come and sing, and we're going to sing this song, and then we're going to have a bit of a response. Again, in the darkness, we were waiting without hope and without light from heaven. What a wonderful picture. You
came running. I imagine the, the, the prodigal son and the father seeing the prodigal son come home. And he runs out to meet the son. And he hugs him. This stinky, smelly, rebellious, pathetic son. But to the father, his son, who has come home. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and the prophets. To a virgin came the word.
give a chance to for people to give thanks to the Lord God. Thank you for choosing us, Lord. Teach us to be your people, to get to know you. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you are not surprised by our wayward, not in hardened hearts, and that you continue to run after us. You look for us. You care for us. Thank you that you um, work in and through us for your good, for glory, for your glory to bring hope and healing to this world. Thank you that we have freedom in you. And I am thankful that Your story spans all of eternity. That your word is so connected that you saw beyond generation after generation after generation. And you worked and you continue to work and you proclaimed what was to come. Who was to come? Jesus Christ. who fulfilled all that the Israelite people couldn't do, who fulfilled and was your pers- your people, representing your people on this earth and bore the, their, the world's sins on your shoulders, and became the great sacrifice that we might be forgiven, that we might have life. Now, you sit beside the Father, your Father, our Father, and you intercede for us, you pray for us, you cry out, you find joy in us, and you and the Father together are, are looking and saying, oh, oh, this is so exciting, what's going on? And you grieve when we turn our hearts, but then you rejoice, and you work as we work together. Thank you that you are our priest and that we are your representatives, your priests on this earth. You know how we pray for this hurting world. Teach us how to be your people in what is increasingly challenging world. Help us to live as whose we are, as who we are in your name. To go back to these first two and one and a half chapters of Peter and to identify, to declare we are your children. We are, have an inheritance. We have a hope. We have new birth, a living hope that we are chosen, that we are your royal priesthood, that we are your people, a holy nation belonging to you, that our hearts might be captured by this love. 
so that the things of this earth, as the song goes, may grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and your grace. Open our eyes to see what is real. Thank you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, any comments, questions, reflections, prayer requests? Yes. Yes. I would like to pray for the accident. There was a ambulance, a fire truck, and the police that went by a little while ago. I'd also like to pay for the fire from a lightning strike north of Castle Gar that happened the day before yesterday. And it's out of control. Yes, fire is all over BC. My heart was just sinking yesterday as the sky changed color. And I thought, oh. So yes, fires and the accident. There's been a crazy number of accidents and just continue to pray for that as well. Yes, yes. Thank you, Saul. Saul's downstairs for those wondering, and they've got a microphone down there. So it's another step forward in being able to hear and respond wherever you may be. So, and um, I am nice to have Shelly here, and uh, I don't know who else is down there. Uh, Audrey's down there, and Gloria. So, um, any, yes. So, uh, Michael's uh, ability to do Zoom from the manor kind of fell apart, partly because of his computer and partly whatever. And he actually just wanted to come to church and be in person. So he's actually downstairs or outside. I don't know what he does. He's, downstairs. Is he downstairs? Okay, good. And um, so, so that's, we're not actually um, going to be meeting at the manor now, for now, at least until the winter falls. We'll see how that goes. But... Um, just to give Michael a break. Have, and no, we, won't be having Zoom at the we won't be having Zoom at the manor. No, we won't be meeting at the manor. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, why? That's a good point, Chris. Well, put that on pause. Ignore <laughs> that one. Um, so I'll, there'll be an announcement about that, what's going on. That's right, but you're absolutely correct. We don't need to. The re oh, the reason, well, whatever, we'll talk later. Yeah, we're fine. <laughs> Um, so, anything else? Um, I don't know if you're aware, there's a long, I may start to make a list again this week of, of things that are going on, of people we know and stuff like that, and there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, well, just varied things that we need to be praying for. Heartache um, and need. Sorry? Heartache and need. Heartache and need, yes. Wendy for Jack and Wendy um, as he continues to proceed in treatment and just in, in this path. Lord, I cry out for you is that you'd bring healing to his body. But I want to thank you for the faith and the trust that there's there. We praise you. Give them strength and wisdom and insight. Thank you. You to pray for Bev for healing and strengthen her, and um, the pain would go away, be alleviated. We pray a blessing on Rick and Dara as they head down south and journey a bit, and may it be a good break of visiting family and safety on the roads. What else is there to pray for? Who? Our prodigals. Mm. Yes, Lord, we pray for our prodigals. Oh, that they might find their come home to you, to the one who loves them.
I want to thank you for the births that have happened. Um, Jeremy Seward's twins, and we pray for uh, as they manage that, uh, what that looks like and the dynamics. We thank you that they're healthy. We pray, thank you that Teresa had her, Bergendahl had her baby, and we pray a blessing on her. Um, we think of there's lots of babies in our community right now, and we pray for safe deliveries that are coming soon. Thank you for the new life. Yes, Lord God, yes. Thank you, Dave. Yes, we pray for those who've lost babies. We pray a blessing on their wombs. We pray for those of us who are getting older and older and older, which is all of us, actually. Um, but some of us feel it more than others. And uh, so teach us how to be your people at this stage in our life, more and more together. How do, can we encourage and strengthen and support? Um, again, with loneliness being such an issue in our community, in our lives, in our society, may we uh, and, and be, continue to be the people who care for one another. Thank you for the many ways that